Hey everybody, welcome to another episode. I'm your host, Chris Shang, and today we've got Sunzay Pasari, who is the Senior Director and Head of Innovation Transformation. Long job title, but over at UPS, uh, has had an extensive background in products, in innovation, in transformation and technology, and I'm super happy to have him here. He's been around the block, uh, some pretty big logos um, like eBay, T-Mobile, amongst those in addition to UPS. But thank you so much for joining us. Tell us a little bit about your background, what you do. Thanks, Chris. Thanks for having me for this podcast. And I'm really excited to show my background here and talk to you. In my current role at UPS, I'm driving innovation and transformation initiatives. And it's a pretty exciting role. And I'll tell you why. Uh, as UPS needs no introduction, it's a 117 year old company. And <clears throat> we are the largest uh, logistic company in the world. And our size is known to the rest of the world. If, if you want to know more, Google it. But so the the key thing for here is with a, with that legacy of 117 years, it means that we have legacy of all sorts of technology as well, you know, sorts of system processes, people, and not to talk about the you know <clears throat> geographical spread, which ex we exist in 200 countries, 200 plus 200 countries today, and so. So that brings a lot of exciting opportunity in terms of you know driving innovation and then. Just to give it a scale, you know, how we operate, like we are moving about 26 million packages from point A to point B. And just imagine you have to make sure that all these packages reach in time and intact and then bring a smile to the end customer for us. And, and everything is driven by technology at the back end, right? From the time that the driver comes and picks up a package at your doorstep to, you know, delivers it to other guys' doorstep. And there's a whole backbone of technology which is running so there's pretty exciting things we are doing here at ups in terms of making us number one logistic company and staying ahead in the race so that's in my current role and i started my career almost like a quarter century back 25 years back and then i got into technology and i got a chance to build i keep bringing this up in my podcast and my talks and seminars you know the first ever app store and that time the term app store was not even there so i was working for this company part of which is called reliance geo now if you google it is one of the largest company telecom companies in the world with 400 million subscribers now uh way back in 2002 i launched first app store and which was like a you know, very small little device and there were no color screens even then when i bought black and white screen and a candy bar phones and Creating, building that whole ecosystem, and then creating, bringing that technology. The limitation I still keep, you know, that you know every application if I have to write it has to be in 64 KB limit. Can you imagine that? You know, 64 KB you are creating a whole application, and today a single image file would be few MBs. You know, KBs is not even considered today. So there's a humongous challenges around technology. So I got a chance to drive innovation, and that was the first big piece of innovation I delivered. And then, of course, not looking back with all the companies around the globe, my world. This is my key, key, you know, mandate to drive innovation, bringing in new products. And in today's perspective, if I talk, you know, and then especially in a company like UPS, you know, the transformation and innovation goes hand in hand. So we have a lot of legacy to deal with and we need to modernize a lot of our technologies and a lot of our systems and applications, platforms, devices, hardware, a whole bunch of things, you know. And when we are doing transformation, and of course we'll be like to be ready for the future. So that innovation piece comes in there. So they go hand in hand. So pretty exciting role I'm in, Chris. Yeah, very cool. Uh tell us a little bit about how you got involved in just tech in the first place, right? Like what what kind of motivates you to go towards that direction out of all the possible directions you could have gone? Very interesting story. Again, goes takes me back to 25 years and makes me a little nostalgic. So, you know, technology has always been a passion for me. And, and the time I got into technology, the internet just came in and Google was just founded. You know, Amazon was just founded. eBay was just founded. <laughs> and a whole bunch of things were happening. And when telecom and the telecom and media and that's where i started my tech career with <laughs> you know the wireless telecom just came in and the only only 
cool product in wireless technology we knew at that point in time was a text messaging. And text messaging has a limitation of 160 characters. I repeat characters, not words. So, you know, one text message could only be 160 characters. And from that point onwards, you know, there was a vision as well, a personal vision as well as industry vision to leave this world where you you deliver technology in the palms of the people and, and empower them to do whatever they want to do in their palms. You know, and it becomes ubiquitous. So you put to, in today's form, today's you know mobile devices, especially the mobile phones, are more powerful than a desktop computer. And and I've seen that whole journey of, of being just able to make a voice call and just send a text which is 160 characters to uh, a powerful computer with uh, Karen in her mobile. So that passion was there. And of course, the telecom companies were looking at someone with the right kind of a background you know, to deliver that. And, and luckily, I had that vision you know, in terms of way back in 2000. So what I delivered, what I launched was in 2002, but I started working on those technologies way back in 98, 99. And and then, you know, you really need that vision and a passion to drive something. And of course, all those technology challenges start falling in place. And so that's how I got into it and, and then started driving innovation. Got it. Um, and, you know, as you kind of like went up the, you know, the corporate ladder and start becoming more of like a pretty much like a thought leader or like the go-to expert, you know, as it comes yeah. to what is shaping different industries uh, in your role. How do you go about staying abreast around all the different, you know, advancements that are out there, but not just that, but like realizing which ones actually deliver, are delivering on tangible ROI, you know, that will be suitable for an organization that you're, you know, that you're, that you're working for. Um, and how do you discern that ultimately uh, versus like what's just noise? Interesting question, you know, um, and uh, I can answer in a many different ways, but let me try to make it simple for the audience. You know, everything, every initiative starts with a problem your organization is facing. You, know, you want to solve something either for your customers or internally for the employees or kind of adding, let's say there are three key things. How do you increase sales and profitability or more revenue and profitability? How do you you know, cut your cost downs and how do you make the processes more effective and make your employees effective. So some some of these are very common things you, you would have heard a million or billion times, you know, this. but it starts with a very specific problem you're trying to chase. Now, once you see that problem, which is at hand today, you, you would like, the way I would like to do is I'd like to see a horizon, which is like, I try to call it an end state or an ultimate, you know, end state where, the things could lead to and this journey between solving this problem in hand now versus wow that wow experience which is in future i mean that's where you start mapping back and seeing you know what can you do today and what can you do in six months what can you do in next two years or what can you do today which could actually feed into next five years from now and 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 of course in, in today's ever-changing dynamic world of technology which is changing by minute not even by hour not even by day it's changing by minute you have to be really abreast uh, you know of, of latest what's happening around so you have to keep the company of right people you know networking with the right set of people and trying to figure out what your peers are doing in other industries in your own industry and how you know some of these cool technologies are developing today and today you know, AI, AI, everywhere you can you'll see AI, I mean, it's just coming, this is a new dimension. So yeah, you have to be updated with what's happening in technology and what is that you can bring on the table to solve the problem today, but also making your organization future ready and, and make sure that what you do today, the benefits are ready for next few years. Yeah, makes sense. Um, and, you know, as you, I guess like the question also comes up where it's, you know, internally you guys you know see that there is a certain problem that you need to solve for how do you decide you know whether it's something that you allocate internal technical resources towards versus uh you know leveraging what might be out there you know from a third party vendor um how do you yeah i guess like are, is that boiled does that boil down to I'll, I'll leave it there. It's like, I mean, I have assumptions, but I'd rather you just kind of just <laughs> jump into what that means and what that looks like. See, 
uh, the answer is pretty simple in today's perspective. If you were asked this same question to me uh, 15 years back or 20 years back, the answer would have been very different. But in today's perspective, the answer for me is very simple. It's a combination of the two. It's not purely inside. It's not purely outside. And then you have to be cognizant of the fact that we, our core business is moving packages from A to B, point A to point B. We, we are still a logistic company, and that's where our bread and butter is. Now, while we are a logistic company, you know we cannot do all the innovation ourselves. So we have to leverage upon ecosystem. So today the game, the, the key point which I'd like to make here this is that it's a game of ecosystem. You know, together we win. And if I try to run alone, probably, uh, you know, I'm setting up myself for a failure. So we are in a perpetual look for external vendors, if I have to use that word and we use that word in external vendors or innovative companies to partner with us to try innovation together. So, you know, companies like us, what, 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 we are good at is you know bringing those different pieces of jigsaw puzzle together so like company a has developed some cool technology company b has done something else c has done something else and of course we are end users of let's say that technology bringing all this together and creating a nice value proposition technological value proposition across bringing these pieces together is that that's something we are good at so I strongly believe in a game of ecosystem today. It's not just about doing internally, doing externally. Yes, a case-to-case -case basis we can figure out, you know, do I have skills enough to do this? And does it even, even if I have skills enough, does it really make sense for me uh, from a commercial perspective, from a GTM perspective, from a value proposition perspective? So even, even though I have skills and someone has really done it and they are better than us, I would rather go to them. So it's a game of ecosystem. Yeah, makes sense. Um, and what's, you know, as you've been in this for, again, you mentioned quarter, quarter of a century now, and, you know, I'm sure you've seen different cycles, uh, things that have, you know, bubbled up and fizzled out and, and things that, you know, ended up sticking around longer than people may have initially thought. What's been some of those things that you've seen where, you know, maybe you had some initial insights where the market got it wrong or, you had you know been bullish about some kind of technology and then and then the market you know ultimately disproves that um and i'm just kind of curious how that leans into with all the advancements today um especially around ai you kind of alluded to that but like not not maybe just what the core of what generative AI, generative ai provides right now but in terms of where the direction of that kind of technology can lead in terms of like operational efficiencies and um, and, and, you know, and extracting, you know, data sets that's going to be a lot faster in real time. Like, how do you think about all that? And maybe think about it like a two-part answer. So first part is like maybe some of the stuff that you've seen that again, like materialized or didn't. I'll take you back to 90s, mid 90s and when the internet just came in. And, you know, if you, if you remember, you know, from mid 90s to late 90s, there was a lot of hype and, and then this whole world called it as an internet bubble and all these companies will go, go for a burst. And of course, that happens in any technology when it happens and there is a lot of enthusiasm and a lot of hype around that. And I've seen it a few times in my career span, you know, and we have seen that hype. And But, but the good thing was, while a lot of things emerged on the backbone, so let us think of what was the backbone then, way back in the 90s, which was really and, and cut back to 2024 today while you're speaking. And today, can you, you can't even imagine your life, life without connectivity. Essentially, it was connecting people, connecting systems, connecting processes, connecting everything, connecting computers and connecting computing and connecting all of that. So with every transformational technological leap, there is a hype which gets built up around that. And of course, there will be few successes and a lot of failures. But that backbone, of technology that is the connectivity which we, which came in. So let me let me take back you to a little more when I was not even born, back to 60s, you know, when the compute started, when the Sagon started, and when the first computer started came in. So that first 30 years from 60s to 90s was an era of the compute. You know, the compute was evolving every day. The chips were getting more powerful. They were able to handle more, more stuff, but 
and i'm i'm sure during that time though i've not seen those times but even during that time there were there were successes and failures and again successes and failures it goes through a few cycles and in mid 90s and <clears throat> till today we are talking there that there was an era of connectivity you know you and between this came ubiquity what what do i mean by ubiquity i was talking about this mobile devices you know that means technology became so progressive that it is there in every palm and today not in every palm it is in your pocket is it in your wrist it is in your you know your pods it is getting proliferated to your your specs and all, all over the place right you know it's, it's so ubiquitous to so <clears throat> there there came in compute there came in connectivity in there and top of it ubiquity and and within that ubiquity world there was another dimension called a cloud dimension so you have seen this all this evolving in last 30 years this connectivity led to cloud and ubiquity this is part of the same and now we are coming to an era of intelligence you know where this all this you know marvelous advancement happening in artificial intelligence and and the next level is generative ai and i'm sure this phase this is also go to a phase of you know some kind of hype some kind of bubble but that backbone of intelligence is going to remain forever you know how do you leverage that backbone for the right key use cases building the right kind of technologies and and solving the right problems will actually leap into next era so i see is a, is as a totally different dimensions and the way i would predict is like next 30 years the world would be very different from you know what you have seen in last 30 years so what you have, what we have seen in last 30 years of technological advancement will become a very fundamental so if even if five or 10 years from now if you start looking at the 30 years oh this should have always have been existed you know i mean there's a given you know so it is it is it is a new dimension the way i see is existing ai gen ai technologies is a new dimension and it's beyond anyone's imagination how would it pan out in terms of what kind of problems you are solving or what kind of use cases will be able to solve and this is exactly what we have seen in last 30 years a lot of things which we never imagined way back in 20 years and today we have like it's, it's all given and for someone like me you know i have to trade a very cautious approach not really jumping into the high bandwagon and trying to do few things which has not been well defined or uh, or you know just trying to put my resources uh into something which we have no clarity on that but at the same time not being too lethargic and trying to take a back seat and say oh no let the rest of the world do it and i can jump in later so we have to keep identifying the real use cases at our end and to make sure that we are investing our energies in right right direction and and again cut back to see ups as company very very specifically where i have still a lot of legacy a lot of transformation work to do so i think it's a it's a right balance striking that right balance became really important for us and that's becomes the name of the game actually yeah absolutely um on that note i was curious more so around you know are there i guess i mean may, maybe this doesn't have to be pertinent to specific to ups but what are some of those changes that you guys are you're thinking about and seeing and making those investments now that you're hoping to realize maybe in the next couple of years and it, it doesn't again it doesn't have to be specific to ups but it could just be in terms of like your own personal hypotheses around different like industry segments that maybe you've been a part of in the past and you're like okay this is going to be truly disruptive here in this space so the first thing is for us to get the backbone ready let's let's and i am not specifically talking more about this intelligence piece because connectivity cloud and ubiquity we have gone through that that's pretty mature and we know what to do and what not to do there i think for for us it is really important to see as a organization and and this is pretty much true from every company i speak to with my peers in the industry you know and the data back where where this this full lot of data in most of the large organizations of our side this full lot of data it's lying all across in different systems different silos and, and different countries put together how do we bring that data together to mine it to get insights of all of it you know i think that is one of the low hanging challenge which we have and most of the companies have is about getting the data together you know clean data sensible data and, and unified data we have 
resources where our different business units and different managers at different levels and different stakeholders can actually work through the data. So that is that is kind of a no-brainer thing which I'm sure you could use and pretty much every company is doing that. For us, if we focus our energies on getting that piece right, that foundation right, I think then it's kind of a, a, a we can keep building use cases and solving problems on top of that. And, and then while we bring that fundamental data or the source data to a unified layer, you know, and we are experimenting with, let's say, putting some ML models to predict few things. Let's let me take an example of dynamic category, for instance. That's a pretty, pretty important use case we're trying to solve. And and dynamic pricing is not just one dimension thing. It's 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 a multi-dimension thing because I have to bring the right kind of insights for a customer. For us, the pricing is not just you know one size fits all, and that's true for most of the industry today as we speak. You know, so even in that use case, what are those insights which are meaningful and that will lead to generating more data, you know, and and synthetic data or real data, and then then on top of our existing raw data or of the source data to more data on that and that leads to that whole cycle of data leads to more data and then to more data and then by more powerful models more powerful compute and, and then by more precise insights now so yeah we are in that journey of doing that and we are pretty much there very cool um and you know beyond beyond you know gen ai i mean obviously it's only become more commercially i suppose um accessible and available and uh and adopted but it's it's you know we're talking about uh in terms of like the fundamentals of what it is it's been adopted within technology for for you know years upon years before this um is there any other kind of you know new technology be it you know blockchain or web3 that some of these things that we've experienced is these buzzes but then didn't come to fruition but still is part of like the 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 there's some parts of infrastructure within the technological landscape, but is there any other kind of, you know, uh, upcoming technology that you're seeing out there um, that's not related to, to Gen AI that also you think is going to be relevant uh, as we kind of embark in the next yeah. like five, 10 years? Totally, totally. For a company like us, let's start with it. And uh, the one, one another technology I just talked about is an edge computing, you know, Today, we need decisions on the spot and their mind, the computing on the edge. And again, it's a very, very broad term for edge computing, but for a different industries, different use cases, it could mean things very differently. Now, edge computing as a technology is now pretty much known, and, and a lot of it is driven by, on the telecom side of the things, with more powerful today via 5G networks. And, and, and I don't want to really get technical here, but I, I understand the difference between a 4G and a 5G, how different it could be, where you talk about network slicing and a whole bunch of you know cool things which you can do. So it's a new dimension. 5G itself is a new technology. And then 5G over the period of time will evolve to 6G, 7G, whatever itself. But but until 5, 4G and 5G onwards, it's a two different world from the network onwards. So 5G itself is a technology, I would say, is something to keep an eye upon. And the industry should start thinking of the use cases where they can leverage upon a 5G. And it's not just about a you know faster streaming of a video or an HD 4K video streaming. It is much beyond that. And edge computing and 5G go hand in hand because you need that nanoseconds of you know uh, a latency to really do some kind of compute. And again, you would have heard it in other other blogs as well for the podcast you know about this cell driving cars, but. It's not just limited to self-driving cars. Imagine a whole bunch of robots moving our warehouses. And we are one of the most modern advanced warehouses. So edge computing, 5G, and then, and then on top of it is uh, you know automated vehicles. Like for instance, all these automated drones, you know, aerial vehicles, the drones which are moving around, and a lot of development happening. In fact, in I am an advisory board of you know, one of those companies who has developed drones for our transportation purposes. So it's not just about an air taxi, which is moving, you know, person from A to B, which is a pretty uh, uh, pretty popular use case today, but they are also developing drones, which can actually take tons of, you know, goods and services from point A to B. So automated vehicles, robotics, 5G, edge computing, are these some of these emerging technologies where which will kind of evolve together. And, and, and on 
top of that, I would also add the way the silicons are created today, you know, and the technology itself is becoming more mature. So silicon, the chips being manufactured through silicon wafers today, but will it get a new material today? The material science piece of it, you know, that is another technology to keep an eye upon. So there are a whole bunch of things happening. And on the on the energy side, you you've heard of solid state batteries. And, and it's not just about solid state batteries about car. Now just think of the application of solid state batteries within our own ecosystem. You know, they are powering not just car, but they are also powering our infrastructure, rest of the infrastructure. So all of these are emerging at a very rapid pace. And today AI is just one piece of it. Now AI, while technology itself is evolving and we take talk of GNI, yeah, but when I talk of an edge computing, that edge computing requires a lot of intelligence. So the AI doesn't just lie uh, within within my premises to uh, or, you know do some kind of digging insights from the data, but also taking real time decisions on the devices that they're, they're getting into the chips themselves. And Nvidia, you guys know, everyone knows you know what Nvidia is doing. So there are actually a whole bunch of them. This is a new dimension of technology, and not just one, Chris. There's a new dimension of technological advancement we are seeing. And trust me, um, you know, may, maybe in the next 30 years, I'll definitely not be working for sure, but but we'll see a very different world. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that's, I mean, it's so true. I mean, there's so many different layers. I think I saw like a, a infographic today around like, you know, at the top of the layer, there's like companies that are using, you know, ChatGPT or some kind of Gen AI and they're wrapping it with the user interface. And, you know, we're seeing a bunch of those types of kinds of little companies pop up now. But you know, they're, they're talking about like the different wrappers of, of technology that goes below that, right? Down to the chips. And then ultimately yep. at the very bottom of it is like the sand that's being used to produce mm -hmm. the chips. And, you know, and, and it's at the end of it, it's all like, it's all really interesting. I think from a more like philosophical or even like, you know, uh, yeah, like more philosophical like perspective of just kind of like it, thinking how this it, all it will be, down to just it will be physical. far more it will be far more real than philosophical sooner than you and me expect. Trust me. Yeah, I believe you. I believe you. Uh, on that note, I want to thank you so much for taking the time today and sharing just your you know your years of expertise and experience and and just yeah diving into some insights that we typically wouldn't get from elsewhere. So thank you so much for taking the time out of your day. It was a pleasure speaking to you, Chris, and I look forward to talking again whenever you have an opportunity. Thank you so much. Absolutely.